and the FBA avoids error-filled speculation. We can identify the function, why the behavior is occurring, and develop good behavior plans. And focus on the most important thing is teaching new appropriate behaviors. So just quickly, when doing an FBA, you want to make sure that the behaviors are observable and measurable, not just kind of like he has bad behavior, he has tantrums, but really talk about how intense they are, when they're happening, why they're happening, um, what's exactly happening, so you can look for um, different changes in that behavior. And it's really important to collect direct behavioral observations in the natural environment, especially for um, disruptive behavior. Collecting data is really helpful. And you also, what's really important too, is to contrast that with typical peers. So we've worked with a couple of kids, for example, that get really disruptive when they lose a board game or something. But if you look, a lot of typical kids do. In fact, I remember one of my sisters, whenever she was lo losing when we were growing up, the board, she accidentally bumped the board, right? <laughs> so that all the pieces would fly everywhere. So, but it was like, ooh, oops. You know, so it's just, um, you know, different. That's what kind of what happens in the real world. And um, record the frequency and rate, really make sure to establish a good baseline, identifying patterns, antecedents and consequences and finding the patterns. And you, and sometimes kids have lots of functions. They've de de developed kind of a generalized disruptive behavior for lots of different situations. So then you might need to take every function and kind of address one at a time. And it might take a little bit longer for the disruptive behaviors to go down, but eventually they will. Um, and then, of course, identifying appropriate replacement behavior that has the same problem and um, that serves the same function as the problem behavior. And Really, I think it's important also to let people know that if you're making that disruptive behavior inefficient and ineffective by ignoring it, that the kid's likely to kind of go through their repertoire and have, you know, an extinction burst and, and really try everything that worked in the past. And then, again, making sure that the functionally equivalent behavior is just as effective and, effic and efficient and practicing it frequently so it becomes automatic. So I'm just going to... Um, show you a couple of more examples. Um, we talked about making it age appropriate and context appropriate, effective and efficient, addressing the same function. And I have this little data sheet that gives some common functions that I can give to Deborah if you're interested, where it's just like a checklist. So these are pretty common things, things that might be antecedents before disruptive behavior, like being told to do something, a change in activity, move, being alone, a lot, a lot of times that doesn't, disruptive behavior doesn't happen alone, but every once in a while you'll see a child that bites himself or something that when they're alone is kind of like more of a self-stimulatory or repetitive RRB taken too far. Told no is a common one. And then what happens after that's maintaining it as a child getting attention, given something, lost something, removed from the area, ignored, punished, or the request might be withdrawn. And then this is really important as figuring out this why. Are they trying to get out of something? Do they need to say, I need help or I need a break? Is it a transition where they need some plan for a countdown or some kind of fun thing at the next task? Is it to obtain something that they're not really learning those appropriate ways to request something? Or is it for attention, avoiding a situation or some other reason? I just wanted to go over the FBA quickly because I feel like that's something we have to do with every child, adolescent or adult that has disruptive behavior. We have to figure out the function, no matter how mild it is. Like I said, I remember when we had our research and training center on positive re behavior support and we were talking about what will get a kick kid kicked out of the classroom. And Rob Horner's like, how aggressive do they have to be to get kicked out of the classroom? How many incidents? And I said, you know what? It's really annoying to teachers if they're just humming all day, right? <laughs> or if they're making noises all day or just, you know, all day long if they're clicking or, or something like that. So it, no matter how small the disruptive behavior is, it, it's important to address and make sure that they're um, really getting, we're getting to the function and really replacing those disruptive behaviors. But that's something, in addition to that, Really, there's a lot of antecedent interventions that can be put in place to in decrease the likelihood that a disruptive behavior will occur. So, um, for example, let me just um, t 
talk a little bit about different things that can be done as an antecedent intervention. One thing that I'm not, I can't really totally figure out myself is that how few times the assessment, the curriculum is assessed. So I go to a lot of schools and I visit schools and I see sometimes they'll have them working in these workbooks and there may be, you know, reading, having to do reading or something like that. And the kids hate it and they're being kind of disruptive and they just say, okay, five more problems, then you can play with your the favorite toy. And so they do kind of reluctantly and kind of, you know, in, don't enjoy it. You can tell they're not enjoying it. So they'll engage in the activity. Then they'll give them a break for 15 minutes to play with their toy alone. Then after the 15 minutes, they try to bring them back to the desk and the kids are getting so disruptive because they don't want to go back to the desk and do that reading. And it just doesn't make sense to me why they don't just have them read things about the toy. Same target behavior, but then they get that toy as a natural reinforcer. And if the kids know they're getting it and not going to be dragged away for in something that's not really that much fun, their disruptive behavior really goes down quickly. And as um, we mentioned before in um, Nova Scotia, we spent a lot of time doing PRT. When I started in the field in, gosh, it was probably the late 70s, we just did that really structured ABA. We took them in a room. We said, Dad, do this, do this, imitate, and things like that. And our studies were like, what if we switch up the reinforcer? Like sometimes we give them M&Ms and sometimes we give them gummy bears. Will they do better? Or Fritos or whatever. Will they do better than if we just give them M&Ms every time? And we never really kind of thought that much about what, that maybe the way we were presenting the curriculum wasn't really that interesting to them. So... It was actually my husband was sitting there in the clinic one day and he's like, you know, I've been doing this a while and the kids are getting better. You know, they're improving. We have all this data. They're improving, but they never seem like they're happy to come in here. It's not like they're running in and saying, you know, excited to come in and the parents are like holding their backs because they have to drag them everywhere. And, and that was all kind of that we knew right then. And we did have to use some punishment. Fortunately, when I was starting, it wasn't the severe stuff like the cattle prods and things and electric shock that were used for the severely aggressive and disruptive behaviors. But, you know, there was, you were taught how to yell at them, no, you know, and bang on the table and even maybe slap their hands if they were stimming or something like that. So it wasn't really fun and not that many people really stayed in the field. There weren't that many kids with autism, but not that many people liked working with the kids and and liked the way we were doing things. And my husband one day is just like, they just don't seem motivated. What is this, you know, how could we motivate the kids to enjoy the session? So we started um, looking at a lot of different ways that maybe would be more fun for the kids. And we published a lot of individual studies. Various people in our clinics published individual studies showing that if we gave the kids some choice, rather than always using the flashcards, gave them some choice of the stimuli that we would use. So if, if they liked M&Ms, we could use that as a stimulus rather than using it just as a reward. Or if they liked bouncing balls a lot, we could use the bouncing balls. We have the same target behaviors. We're just using what the child chooses and is interested in. If we varied the task I, I think a lot of people still get into this rut sometimes of thinking you have to do an eight out of 10 till before you can move to the next step. But varying the task so it's not so drill-like and over and over again seems to really help the kids responding and, and um, interspersing easy and more difficult tasks. This is a study that Glenn Dun Dunlop did a long time ago. And I remember working with him and I was thinking, I was trained as a speech therapist and we always just drilled the language structures that the kids didn't know how to produce. And I remember thinking, well, that's not going to work. Shh, don't tell them I thought that. But I was thinking back in my mind, that's not going to work. If you're doing like six easy ones and then a hard one, it's going to take forever to teach those tasks. But it worked really well because the kids didn't avoid. So they had like this behavioral momentum and they'd get it right, get it right, get it right. Then a hard one and they'd try and then they'd more likely get it right and more likely try. So we had a lot lower levels of disruptive behavior and a lot higher levels of responding and correct responding. And then getting the natural reinforcers. This is just the way we teach typical kids. We don't sit them down and use flashcards and drill them over and over again. We 
use these natural reinforcers for the kids when they're talking and engaging and playing with us. And that's makes more sense, especially when kids are learning their first words. If they're having to imitate sounds. It's so meaningless and they're probably going to try to avoid the session. But if you have a real item that they like and you say ball or candy or something that they're going for and enjoy, or even bye-bye. I've had a lot of kids, their first word was bye-bye because they hated being in the session. (laughs) And in fact, we have, when I was in Santa Barbara, sometimes families would drive all the way from you use, um, sorry, drive all the way to, from Los Angeles to come to UC Santa Barbara. And I, we'd say, okay, we're going to, they're nonverbal. We're going to, you know, and all they wanted to do was just leave. So we'd have them say bye-bye and we'd say, okay, you have to go. And they just got there and the parents would be like, I just drove in heavy traffic, hundreds of miles, you know, and we'd say, but you have to reinforce it right away. And then the next time they come in, They might wait a few minutes and say bye-bye, or they could say bye-bye, and you could take them for a walk, and then have them say bye-bye again, or go, or open to leave the room. But sometimes that's really helpful because that's the only natural reinforcer that they really want at that time. So looking at what the kids really want at that time and and using that as first words, using the whole words, we don't break it out into sounds because we don't want to model the inappropriate sounds, but just using the whole word and having the children's make an attempt. We also found that when we use that strict shaping paradigm and really made the kids do a better, at least as good as the previous response or a better response each time, it got them frustrated. But if we were, so we're, if we worded the attempts, then we, they did a lot better. So Remember, what we're thinking about is this bigger underlying concept of motivation. Because if you have a child that is not motivated, they're not going to want to talk. And it's like you and me. It's all children, right? If, if they, if there's a mean teacher, they don't want to go to school every day. If they hate the curriculum, they're not going to want, if they're never getting anything right because it's so hard for them, they're not going to want to engage with you. But if you have their favorite things and you're really looking at everything they want and for initial communication is really important to look at exactly what they want. And then there's a reason for attempting to make a sound or produce the word for it. And if they're, even if they're, um, doing a lot of avoidance behavior, they'll still be more likely to respond because they're, motivated for that activity. And they get that natural reinforcer. So when we first, our earliest study that we published using all of these as a package was with children who were not using first words and are very infrequently using first words or were nonverbal. And what we found is they, we had done therapy for many, many years using a more structured you know what, this is ABA, but it has like the motivational components. And we, when we didn't put the motivational components in there, the children didn't respond as well. So we did some studies showing that we called it natural language paradigm because we started with um, words and it looked like we kids learn more naturally. But then we realized that it was appropriate to other activities. So we renamed it pivotal response treatment. So the earlier studies, you can see that they have, um, that they're, that they're maybe labeled as a um, natural language paradigm at, when they worked on just communication, and now we call it more pivotal response treatment. 